Um, I'm Habib Samadhi from the Georgia Heart Institute, and it's my privilege on this morning of May 4th to host uh, Dr. Yoshi Koniko from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Yoshi, you're currently Surgical Director of the Structural Program. Yes. And you just delivered a phenomenal uh, uh, GHI Grand Rounds. And with us is Dr. Rani Ramadan, the Director of our Structural Heart Program here. So, uh, Yoshi, welcome. Thank you. And Ronnie, thanks for joining and hosting Yoshi Absolutely. and inviting him down. Absolutely. I'm excited to see Yoshi. Uh, I've missed you. It's been a couple months. A couple so, months, so it's yes. great to have you uh, down here in Georgia. Yeah. No, thank you for having me today. Well, Yoshi, what a fantastic talk. And I think the title of your talk was, you know, the Structural Heart Program and how whether surgeons and cardiologists can coexist. Um, so uh, as a cardiac surgeon and leading the structural program at the Brigham, Tell us why it's important for cardiologists and surgeons to coexist and work in this incredible space that we're in, structural heart disease. You know, so as I mentioned in the talk, traditionally the surgeons and the interventional cardiologists were enemies. Um, that's, we, we fought over patients, um, we fought over procedures, and we were never really a team, um, despite the fact that the heart team concept really started with coronary disease. But um, with the creation of TAVR, we have this concept of heart team that really solidify within a lot of the institutions. And we have done a very good job so far of keeping this heart team structure. And the question is, can we keep this in the future? And it really depends on how the surgeons and the interventional cardiologists get along and can coexist. Yeah. No, and that's so true. And Ronnie, I know you've lived this too, both in yeah. Boston and now here um, in Gainesville at Northeast uh, uh, Georgia Health System. Um, so um, you guys coexisted in Boston, um, <laughs> but um, t tell us what, what are the secret ingredients? You talked about trust. You talked about the importance of diversity in a team. Um, how do you ensure that that comes together? How do you sustain it? How do you put the team together? So I think that, you know, as I mentioned, I think trust is very important. But um, also at the same time, you know, we have to have a value in that, both as an individual physician and also as a much larger vantage view. Um, so from the individual standpoint, being in a team, you know, will create more teamwork, more collaboration, right? Um, realistically, you will get more referrals from the, from the cardiologists that you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be more interaction with the people that you want to work with. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of benefits from the individual level. And then I think there's another sort of vantage point, um, vantage view, that you want to make sure that, you know, from a patient care standpoint, um, we're going to provide the best care by having two experts providing their opinions and based on the most recent evidence, um, what can we do to, to, to get, provide that best care to the patient? Um, you know, from the program standpoint, I think there's more and more pressure to, to do more cases. But at the same time, as a team, you'll be graded as a team, not as an individual. So I think there's a lot of incentive from different standpoints um, that will benefit this. And I think having that value is so much important to yeah. making this really successful. And I'll be really interested to hear what Ronnie thinks too. No, I, I completely agree. And, and, and you mentioned the, uh, the joy of working yes. together, right? Yeah. So I think once you have that bond between your interventional cardiologists, your surgeons doing mm -hmm. procedures, you develop yeah. this bond that you actually enjoy doing these cases together. Right. You enjoy coming to work, uh, mm -hmm. seeing patients together. So I think that adds another element. I mean, obviously, it's important for patient care and doing the best thing um, as a uh, as a team, uh, but also enjoying work and, and working together. Is, is, I think is a definitely a big plus. It is. I know that you have that. At, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, you and, and uh, Dr. Shah at Brigham. You yeah. guys are like you like <laughs> twins. You know. <laughs> Uh, so I think it's it's really crucial. He's older, uh, but yeah. He's old, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He won't hear this. So. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's pivot a little bit. Okay, so we've established a team effort, and it's important to say that here at Georgia Heart, I think we've got a very strong 
you know, team as well, Ronnie, that you and, and Dan Winston and Pranav Kansara, Kyle Thompson, the whole team, and Alan Wolf, right? Yeah, Dr. Wolf, Alan yeah. Wolf, who's a phenomenal uh, open surgeon. But let's pivot a little bit and just talk about the substance of this incredible field of structural heart disease, right? It's, you know, it started 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. um, and it's really expanded. Um, I personally, as someone not doing those procedures, I'm fascinated by not only the tip of the iceberg, which is kind of where you see the sickest patients, yeah. but with the explosion of, you know, heart failure, mm -hmm. these, you know, moderate valvular lesions that are, you know, whether it's mitral or tricuspid, as well as the complexity of assessing even moderate severe aortic stenosis, mm -hmm. uh, low gradient aortic stenosis. And, and it's, it's become such a niche area with so much physiology, so many different sort of treatment options, whether it's medical, surgical, or percutaneous, that it's almost become the realm of the specialist in the valve yeah. clinic. So talk to me a little bit, both of you, about how do you see the intake of valve patients as the years go by in the next five years? You want to start first, Ron? Yeah, absolutely. So I, you're absolutely right. I think, I think it's, um, I would say it's a pandemic of heart failure patients that we're seeing. And uh, the concern that I personally have, a lot of the patients that come to us with moderate MR, moderate TR, they're often not um, recognized as, as, a, as a potentially an entity that's going to become a lot worse down the line. And those patients are not receiving the care that they probably should at that point because, you know, they have a lot of other issues. Yeah. They often have heart failure. So there's a lot of focus on a lot of other conditions. And what, I, uh, what we're trying to actually do here at the Georgia Heart Institute, we're trying to develop a specialized clinic mm -hmm. that we are calling a cardiomyopathy, valvular cardiomyopathy clinic, where mm -hmm. basically the heart failure docs, the cardiologists, the imagers, the interventional cardiologists, and the surgeons could yeah. actually all see those patients at the same time mm -hmm. because they're very complicated. Yeah. And uh, trying to make sure that we do all the proper therapies medically, potentially interventional, like uh, CRT or... PCI if they need to, uh, and then determine the appropriate timing when a potential you know, procedure like a mitral clip or mm -hmm. tricuspid intervention might be uh, timely for those patients. Um, so I do think it's really important to identify those patients, treat them early, follow them, uh, because if you don't, what we've seen, they come to you very late in the game yeah. at a point where their LVs are or RVs are really in bad shape and they have no options, whether percutaneous or surgical. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious what you think, Yoshi, about yeah. those patients. You know, I think in the field of TAVR, um, the next field in TAVR will be the asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. So there's been a couple papers on the surgical side, the recovery trial, and there was one more that came out recently, avatar trial, that both showed that asymptomatic severe AS surgery, early surgery provides better outcomes. And there's a clinical trial on the TAVR side, early TAVR trial that closed, um, that will be probably presented in the next 12 months, um, 12 to 24 months, about the results of asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, treating them early. So I think that's the next field. And then what you're talking about with the moderate aortic stenosis, before reaching that severe is probably the next frontier after that. There's been some early evidence showing that even those patients don't do well if they have moderate AS. But where is, go where is going to be the line of doing procedures in these you know, moderate to severe patients that are asymptomatic? I think that's, that's something that we will see in the next 10, 15 years, um, yeah. in my opinion. And for us to do that, I think what you guys are doing is sort of pioneering this, to have a non- interventional cardiologist being engaged in the structural clinic, in the heart team clinic, I think that'll be the key moving forward. Um, yeah. And we have a couple of them involved. Um, it's going to be very difficult how we're going to incorporate them with the efficiency that we want to provide to the patients. That's something that, uh, that I think we're going to have to think about a little more in the future. No, oh, that's exciting. So I think you covered the mitral tricuspids and Yoshi, you, you even extended that in the aortic space. Um, well, um, okay, so here's another question for the two of you, uh, particularly Yoshi, you as a, you know, as a cardiac surgeon who I think we were chatting earlier, you spend 60% of your time doing open 
yes. procedures, you know, surgical procedures, and, mm -hmm. and 40 percutaneous. Yes. Um, obviously, the, 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 what the value that you bring to the table is you have an all-of-the-above treatment strategy for the patient, right? Right. You yes. have all the percutaneous options, and then you have percutaneous failures, mm -hmm. and you have surgical options. From a surgical perspective, how realistic is it for surgeons to maintain that diverse skill set? Yeah. And how big of a program do you need to have that level of expertise? You know, as um, Joe Bavaria, who was one of our um, STS presidents, said, there's no T in TAVR anymore. Um, TAVR has become the ADR um, right. in, in this day and age. And for, for the graduating surgeons, if they're going to do a valve, I think they just have to be involved in this structural space. That ratio, you know, how much of surgery you're going to do and how much of a transcatheter therapy you're going to do will really depend on, number one, how your practice is, um, and number two, what your interest is. So I think depending on what you want to be, I think that percentage will change. If you want to be sort of an expert in structural heart, I think that percentage has to be closer to 50 um, if you're mainly selling yourself as a valve surgeon, but also want to be involved in that, you know, cutting edge technology, I think that percentage will be lower than 50%. So that's a hard question to answer. I don't think there's any perfect answer for that one. Yeah. But uh, one thing that I know for sure is that, um, I think the surgeons, we have to have a value and providing that surgical option definitely is one of them. Yeah. It's fascinating to me as someone who doesn't do structural work. Uh, not only how explosive the structural field is, but almost how um, the, the, the lines between surgeon and interventional cardiologist is blurring mm -hmm. to some extent in the structural field. Um, and yet, as a surgeon, when you're on call, you need to also be able to take care of the bypass patients. Right. And so right. in the coronary space, um, you know, I think although we work really closely with our surgical colleagues, we don't double scrub, we don't routinely see patients together mm. um, and, and I, I don't know if I think the coronary field is mature enough that yeah. that's unlikely to develop over time right but so how does a coronary surgeon yeah. retain their coronary skills uh -huh. particularly that a lot of those easier coronary cases are done percutaneously and really the tougher cases are going to surgery right um, as I mentioned in my talk, the heart team concept started with coronary disease. Yeah. <laughs> True. And I think the, um, the actual heart team in coronary will look a little different because, you know, it doesn't mandate, the PCI does not ma mandate having a surgeon in the room, um, you know, vice versa. So I think the, uh, the heart team on the coronary side will probably be a little different. But, um, you know, what, uh, what we have been discussing at our institution is to sort of have the coronary team whenever there is a complex CAD. Um, of course, the guideline recommendations with left main and three vessel disease, you know, can make it very, very simple. But, you know, before I came down to Atlanta yesterday, I did see a patient that was 79, morbid obese, four vessel disease, but was on a wheelchair. And, you know, her husband was treated with PCI and she had a strong, strong interest of being treated with PCI. Was she inoperable? No, but um, at the same time, you know, she was high risk mm -hmm. and I spoke to one of my interventional colleagues and, you know, he was willing to do it with two stage procedures. Mm -hmm. And are we providing the best care for the patient? I think we are by doing that collaboration and heart team approach. So I think the, um, the, the team may look slightly different from the structural heart team, mm -hmm. but I think there's room to grow a coronary heart team as well. Well, wonderful. Well, what a, what a great note to end on. I think we've covered you know, a lot about structural, you know, where the field's going, why the importance of the heart team for structural and brought it right back home to the <laughs> coronary uh, heart team where it all started. So with that, Yoshi, thank you so much for coming and giving a phenomenal talk. And we look forward to seeing you more in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Thank you.